Today we have a feast of faith, but not only a feast of faith, because really every day is a feast of faith in the Orthodox Church. All the saints exemplify, all the feast days we celebrate exemplify what it means to be faithful. Today is a really a testimony to examples of great faithfulness. In spite of the greatest opposition, the greatest temptations, the greatest possible distraction, faithfulness. We who have been in darkness have seen a great light. Joy has shone forth to us. We were falling over the abyss of had a hand reach down to us and grab us. We were drowning in the abyss of our sins have had the Lord pick us up out of it and rescue us and put us in the saving ark of the church. We who have been deathly ill have had our wounds bandaged and healed by the loving balm of the Lord's grace. What is our response? Last week we saw Thomas, who when Thomas saw this with his reason, proclaim my Lord and my God, but of course then he goes out and lives a life of full faithfulness. Today we see examples of a group of women and several men who exemplified this faithfulness. First and foremost, as we see in the icon, we should point to the Mother of God herself. Not only was her whole life dedicated to her son, her way of life to her son, but at the cross itself, she took aside any distraction she had, any fear of how she might be seen, any thoughts for what was going on at home or whatever, and wept profusely at the presence of the death of her son, who she knew to be far more than just an ordinary human, far more. But that was real prayer, embodied prayer, with everything she had, as we heard in the hymns on Holy Friday, she tore her hair, beat her breasts, and wept at the presence of God, put aside all distracting thoughts, and everything was focused on her son. And that was her life after that as well. The stone of her heart had already been rolled away. Then we have the myrrh bearers themselves. Several times we have Mary Magdalene mentioned and several of the other women that are also portrayed in the icon and in the scriptures who go there knowing that they're probably being watched, knowing that this man was considered a criminal by the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, knowing that the people had just called for his crucifixion. And they go there not with a, a mere pound of ointment, but with a hundred pounds of ointment, as Joseph gives them. One pound was enough in this age. They gave everything they had because this was someone special. They had seen the miracles, they had heard the teaching, they had seen people being raised from the dead and responded with great faithfulness. Despite the fact that they had just witnessed this horrific form of execution, which the Romans apparently got from the Phoenicians and used it as a method to break down the people, really. Who, who would want that? Who was willing to undergo that? They knew they could break people to their will. And this innocent man suffered the most brutal form of death, but also taking our sins, every bit of pain anyone of us has ever experienced upon himself at that moment. And they wondered, who will roll the stone away for us? They didn't understand this. How could they understand this? The Lord did not need the stone to be rolled away. He could have come through just like he did the doors the week before. But he did it for them. For the people to be able to see, because the Jews had set a watch, the best that they had. They had put soldiers there. They would sealed the tomb. No man could have changed this. Certainly not a group of women could have changed this. And what happened is the stone was rolled away. And the stone also was rolled away from their hearts to see even more deeply, as Mary Magdalene will soon hear Mary. She will cry out, Teacher, good morning, back to him. They showed exemplary faithfulness, kept serving the Lord at the cross while others had fled, with the exception of John. But they stayed there no matter what, knowing that the repercussions for being at that cross could be them being paid 
as followers of that man that we don't like. Then we have Joseph of Arimathea, the noble counselor. We're not giving a ton of information about him, a little bit about his being a part of the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, and a very devout man with some money, had that tomb outside the city which no one had laid in. And Joseph does something unthinkable to us. He goes to Pilate and asks for the body of Jesus. Imagine that. That's not like going before our co-worker. That's not like going before somebody on the streets and proclaiming Christ, which we should be doing. That's not like going before our boss. Increasingly, it's getting like going before the leaders of the United States. It's more like going before the leader of ISIS and saying, I'm a Christian. But they did so. He did so with boldness. Pilate, as we'd seen in previous weeks, questioned all of this himself. His heart wasn't totally removed from it. And he gave him the body of Jesus allowed him to take him and wrap him and anoint him as, as the custom was, but even beyond that, to give him the best that he had, to become a faithful follower, also being pegged now as a follower of the Nazarene. Then we have Nicodemus or Nicodemus, we should be here in Greece. And Nicodemus, we don't have a lot about him, he seems to be a rather educated man, a thoughtful man. We hear him talking to Christ about what it means to be born again. Nicodemus is one who, before the Pharisees, when they are desiring to kill this man, says, do we put a man to death before he has been heard? The man had guts. <coughs> the man had courage. The man had faithfulness. Unlike so many modern academics who won't question the system for fear, in his reason, he questioned. This is wrong. This is not what we teach. This is not faithful. We must stand up against this kind of hypocrisy and tyranny, really. And he stood up. And the stone was rolled away from his heart. And he could see Christ. And that is what we are to do. In the weeks following Pascha, we always have these great temptations to slacken, to decrease our efforts. And yes, we are given consolations, undoubtedly, by the Lord and His mercy. But what we, we should be doing is adding fire to fire, adding more prayer to our prayers, beginning our prostrations again, keeping the fast days as they've come up again, with diligence, laying aside worldly entertainments which we realize were distracting us tremendously when we got rid of them during Lent. And attending church, where church attendance has been rather sparse, which is common at this time of year. But our examples are the apostles, our examples are the myrrh-bearing women, our examples are Joseph and Nicodemus, who didn't slacken up, who didn't turn away. They followed with every single thing that they had. They heard the words and said, My Lord and my God as well, <clears throat> and gave everything they had to Christ with each moment, with each second of every day, and the stone was rolled away. And we must seek, too, for the stone to be rolled away from our hearts. When we slacken up any time of year, but much less after Pascha season, when we should be more fervent than ever, because we have heard the joyous proclamation of the resurrection that Christ is risen, and because of that, we hear all things are made new. And if all things are made new, why aren't we made new? We must show the fervency. We must show the faithfulness. We must show the courage of the myrrh-bearing women, of Joseph and Nicodemus. And whatever it is that that stone is, whether it's our anger, whether it's our pride, whether it's our lust, whether it's our slothfulness, whether it's our bitterness or criticism of others, whatever it may be, whether it's just this sickly worldly belief that I'm doing enough, I don't need to go to church anymore, I don't need to do any more than I'm already doing, 
which is straight from the devil. We need to roll that stone away. We should aside and act as people who have been pulled up out of the drowning waters, who have been pulled up over the edge of the abyss, who have been healed of their disease, and have heard Christ is risen, and realized the full power of that, that he has taken on our flesh and raised it up to the right hand of the Father. And because of that, nothing, 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 as I've said many times, can ever be the same again from this day, from this hour, from this minute, as St. Herman tells us. We must follow God and love him above all else. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen.